weeping and singing that song with everything that she had. And you sit there and you go, why? How can you sing at such a time as this? And the answer is, is because of what we're talking about this morning. The answer is, is because the tomb was empty and he wasn't there. For he had risen, as he said. Last summer, my family and I got to go experience something that we never had before. We got to go watch batting practice for the Texas Rangers, the world champion Texas Rangers, by the way, live from the field. It was an amazing experience. In fact, my son Luke got a ball tossed to him by Marcus Simeon while we were there, and his eyes lit up. He's, he doesn't know what to say in that picture right there. He's just flabbergasted that one of his heroes would have touched that ball that he's holding there. But it was super cool. We got to spend time there. We, we watched them play. We watched them practice. We, we, we heard the coaches talking to the guys. We saw them interacting with each other. And, and it was super cool. We even got to, to take a picture with Will Smith and, uh, and, and talk with him for a minute, which again, my kids said nothing because they were just in awe that this professional baseball player was right there. By the way, that guy's ginormous. Like I'm a guy of average height and I look like a child next to him. But it was such a cool experience. We showed up at the ballpark and, and we met a representative there and, and we went down this special elevator and we went through this tunnel system that, that took us to these steps and then we walked up the steps and stepped foot on the field and there they were. And it was just this experience that is a memory we won't soon forget. And yet none of that would have been possible if we didn't know the right person. None of that would have been possible. It's not like anyone can just walk into the ballpark and walk up to that elevator and take it down to the field level and make their way through the tunnels and walk up onto the field and just say, hey, I'm just here. I just want to watch some batting practice. You have to be with someone who has the right clearance. Well, life after death, y'all, is like that too. Heaven isn't accessible for anyone who just simply says, well, yeah, I want to go to heaven. I'm a good person. If you want access to heaven, if you want access to life after death, you need to be with the right person to get you there. And there's only one person who can get you to heaven. And his name is Jesus. Our text this morning will tell us how you can be sure that you know that right person, that you know Jesus, and that you will experience heaven. You will experience eternal life after death. Romans 6, 5 is going to be where we are this morning. Romans 6, 5. The Apostle Paul says this in Romans 6, 5. He says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. If, if we've done this, then this will happen. Uh, let me talk to the parents out there because you know this all too well. You look at your kids and say, hey, look, if you clean your room, maybe we'll go get ice cream later. That's an active contingency, isn't it? You're looking at them saying, hey, look, if you do this, then you'll get this. That's, uh, we've been spending time in our, our church as we read through the daily Bible reading in the Old Testament law, and that was the contingency of the law. If you do these things, blessings will follow. So there's an active contingency. But, but this statement that, that Paul makes in Romans 6, 5 here, if you've been united with him in a death like his, you will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. It's not so much an active contingency as a passive one. If you have been united with him, united with who? Well, we're talking about Jesus, his death and his resurrection. If you want to get to heaven, you have to make sure that you've reached the first part of this conditional statement, that you, in other words, have been united to his death. That's something that comes through faith, through embracing Christ's death as your own death. The, the greatest problem facing humanity today is not climate change or disease or war or famine or any natural disasters. And it's not gas cars versus electric cars. It's not a despotic regime. It's not a particular political party. It's not oppression or racism or poverty or materialism. The greatest problem facing mankind may have something to do with all of those things, but it's not at its core any of those things. The greatest problem facing humanity is the same greatest problem that's been facing humanity from the dawn of time. And that is the problem of sin. 
the problem of sin. And the Bible makes clear that this is a universal problem. In Romans 3.23, the Apostle Paul, the same one who wrote in our text in Romans 6.5 that we're looking at, he earlier said this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's everyone, universally. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we say, well, what's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is that sin carries with it a consequence. And that consequence is laid out for us in Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is death. We understand the concept of wages. You go to a job or, or you've had a job at some point and you go and you, you work and you work for wages. In other words, your wages are what you earn, what you merit, what you deserve for what you've done. Well, here it's cast negatively. The wages of our sin, and again, everyone has sinned, and the wages of that sin is death, is death. And it's not just physical death, it's an eternal death. It's a death forever suffering under the wrath of God for our sin. And let me tell you, from here, the bad news gets worse. This is pretty bad news so far. But it gets worse because here's the, the, the cold, stark reality. You and I can't do anything about that. We've sinned and we're done. We've sinned and it's over. We've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and now the wages of that sin is a death and that's a death that we can't pay because it's more even than physical death. It's eternal death. It's like this. The other night I was watching the world champion Texas Rangers and Jonah Heim was catching in the game and it was late in the game. You guys may know where I'm going with this if you're watching the same ball game I was. And the batter's up to bat and he swings at a pitch and as he swings at the pitch, clearly he foul tips the, the, the pitch. But it was, it, was a, it was hard to see live. It just nicked off the end of the bat and then rolled away from the catcher. Well, the catcher, everybody else on the base path thought it was a pass ball. And if a pass ball happens, then the people on the base path, they can just run. And so the people started running. And Jonah Heim, rather than getting up and going and picking up the ball and, and throwing it down to third base to get the runner out, he starts turning around and arguing with the umpire about how it was a foul ball and it should be a dead ball and everybody needs to go back to the base. Meanwhile, the base runner sees what's happening, runs all the way from second base around third base and comes in to score to take the lead in the game. This is the eighth inning that we're talking about here. That's a pretty big mistake for our catcher to make. Now, granted, was he right? Yeah, the ball was foul tipped. But in the moment, what was his job? His job was to go get the ball and tag the runner out. So he had fallen short of what was expected of him. He had failed and man, he was kind of the goat at that point, not the greatest of all time, the opposite, right? The, the goat as in the one that you're going to blame for the loss. Well, then guess what happens? Just so happens that in the ninth inning, the Rangers tie the game. Well, guess who comes up with a chance to win the game in the ninth inning? Jonah Heim. Actually, I think it was extras at this point. Jonah Heim, the guy that made the mistake with the foul tip, he's up to bat now. He has a chance to be the hero and win the game. And guess what he does? He laces the ball to right center field and the Rangers win the game. Guess who doesn't care about the foul tip anymore? Everyone that's a Rangers fan, right? <laughs> Jonah Heim's the greatest guy ever. He redeemed himself. You totally redeemed yourself, right? Nobody's going to remember the mistake because of what he did to make up for the mistake. Y'all, that's not how sin works, though. We can't redeem ourselves. When we sin and fall short of the glory of God, there is no redemption arc for us. There, there's no comeback that we can make. There, there's no ability for us to undo what we have done. The Bible makes this clear as well. Also in Romans, in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, Paul says, For by the works of the law, in other words, by being good enough, being a good person, obeying enough, he says, no human being will be justified in God's sight. That word justified means to be declared righteous, to be declared not just not guilty, but innocent. And, and so if we're guilty in our sin, that means we can't do enough good works to make up for that. No human being can be justified through obedience. It's impossible is what the Apostle Paul is saying. He says it there in Romans 3.20. He also alludes to it here in Romans chapter 7. He says, the very commandment that promised life proved to me instead to be death. And what he's saying here is we look at the law and we think to ourselves, well, I can be a good enough person. I can be a good, I can obey enough that God will love me. I can obey enough that God will accept me. But Paul in Romans 7 is saying the, the, the command, the law that offered that hope to us eventually crushes us because the, the law simply shows us that we can't. We can't. Because you know what God's standard is, y'all? 
It's perfection. It's absolute perfection. And once you are imperfect, you can't become perfect. Once you've fallen short, you can't make up for that. Again, there's no redemption arc when it comes to salvation. So we're left here like those that are, are, are completely helpless before God. It's like someone shows up at the, the ballpark, like I was talking about earlier, and, and just wants to walk into the stadium, find that elevator, go down the elevator, walk through the tunnel, and walk out onto the field. You're going to get stopped because you don't have the right clearance, and you can't earn the right clearance. You can't bribe anybody to get the right clearance. You have to be with the right person to gain access. And that right person isn't you. And it's not me. So we're left helplessly estranged from a holy God with no hope of paying the debt that our sins have incurred. The wages of sin is death. We can't pay for that. And staring at an eternity of suffering as a punishment for those sins. In fact, the Bible puts it this way in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 27, that we would have a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Happy Easter, y'all. Go and be blessed. It's not a pretty picture. So then what is the solution, right? Pastor, what do we do with this? I didn't come here for you to tell me that, man, I'm alienated from a holy God and now I'm in trouble because I can't do anything about it. What's the solution? How did Jesus overcome our sin to get us to heaven? How did Jesus come for us to grant us access to heaven? This is where the first part of Romans 6, 5 really comes into play. For if we have been united with him in a death like his. Y'all, your only hope for getting to heaven begins with a right understanding of a death that took place almost 2,000 years ago. Your only hope for life is anchored to that death. Without a connection to this death, you have no hope in heaven, no hope in paradise, no hope in resting in peace. But if you've been united with him by faith to that death, you get the hope you get the paradise and you get that future peace because you get all the benefits of his death as though it were your own. Our first point this morning is this. I want to make sure that you are sure that his death is your death. Be sure that his death is your death. The wages of sin is death. You can't die that death. He could. So I want you to make sure this morning, first thing is, is, is first, that, that his death is your death. My wife and I have, have twins, and uh, by God's grace, they have survived to be uh, almost seven years old. Um, and I mean that. That is an act of God. Uh, but when they were, were born, and, and we would take them out in, in, around in public and everything, and they used to be cute as, as babies and everything, people would look at them and be like, oh, look at that, you've got twins, two for one. Nope. The only thing that they have shared cost-free is the womb. That's it. That's it. The OB charged us to deliver two babies. The, the hospital, they charged us to take care of two babies. McDonald's, when I go there, even still today, two Happy Meals, I have to pay for both of them. I don't get to be like, well, but they look the same. It's two for one. One benefits from the other one, right? That's not how it works. We don't live in a world where somebody benefits from the payment of somebody else. And yet, y'all, that's what the gospel is. We benefit from the payment made on our behalf by somebody else, by Jesus. That Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that our debt is paid. In fact, that's what Paul says explicitly for us in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. He says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, meaning in our sins, God made alive together with him, meaning with Jesus, having forgiven us all our trespasses. How? How did he forgive us his, our trespasses? Verse 14, by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. That's good news, church, that your payment has been paid, the record of debt. It used to be, now it's all electronic, but it used to be your credit card bill would come in the mail and you knew what kind of month it was gonna be based on how thick that envelope was when you pulled it out, didn't you? And, and you would pull it out sometimes and open it up and there's page after page after page after page of charges. And you're looking at that and at the very bottom is that number that you owe and you're scanning for that number and then you get there and after a little bit of a heart attack, you start thinking to yourself, how am I ever gonna pay this debt? Paul's saying, 
spiritually speaking, the debt that you incurred for your sin, God took that bill and nailed it to the cross. In other words, God took that bill and he put it on Jesus' account. God took that bill and he had his son pay it for you so that now your debt is paid. So that now you don't owe him anything else. That's what it is to be united to his death. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 6, verses 6 through 7. We know that our old self was crucified with Jesus. Anybody in the room crucified with Jesus? No, I don't think so. It was 2,000 years ago. How were we crucified with Jesus? Well, we're crucified with Jesus when by faith we are united with his death. His death becomes our death. So our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. In other words, rendered powerless so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin for one who has died has been set free from sin. See, we benefit from his death. His death becomes our death in the eyes of the Father so that he looks at us and says the the payment has been paid. But it's not just that the payment's been paid, y'all is that you have had the righteousness of Jesus now fully credited to your account. See, that's called the great exchange. And it comes through for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says, for our sake, he made him to be sin. Jesus, to be sin. Whose sin? My sin. My sin that I still commit. He made him to be my sin. Your sin. So that, what? So that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. That's the great exchange. Completely a raw deal for Christ. But the best deal we could ever receive. When we are united to his death by faith, it's not just that the payment's been made and now your balance is zero. Because if that was the case, we would just continue to rack up debt. Because until we die and go to be with Jesus, y'all, we are still carrying around this body of flesh with us. We still have to battle temptation. We still have to fight sin, and we still fall. We still sin. And and so if if salvation is simply that you were brought back to square, and then God looked at you and said, good luck from here on out. I, I, I got you back even. Just don't do anything else wrong. Man, we're still in a whole heap of trouble. And that's why being united with his death is not just about the payment made, but the credit applied. Because now you have the unlimited resources of the righteousness of Christ placed into your account. And so you are righteous. And that will never deplete. It will never run out. And now when the Father looks at you who have been united to the death of Christ, he looks at you and he sees the righteousness of his son. Be sure his death is your death. This is what John 3.16 is talking about when it says, For God so loved the world. Or in 1 John 3.16, when John says, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. Or in Romans 5.8, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, so now the Father looks at you. If you have been united to the death of Christ, the Father looks at you and no longer sees a balance due. The Father looks at you and no longer sees that you owe the wages of your sin because your debt has been paid. And more than that, you never have to fear fear incurring that debt again because Christ has credited your account with his full and perfect righteousness. So now the Father sees me and grants me that access to heaven that I don't have on my own because I've got Christ's clearance. I've got his access because his death is my death. I'm with him. But here's the thing, y'all. None of that happens without the cross. None of that happens without the cross. And this is why every other religion aside from Christianity will fall short. This is why Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam and Judaism and Mormonism and atheism and even, yes, cultural Christianity can get you to the grave but can't get you out of the grave because you don't know Jesus. He's the only hope for life after death, the only hope for heaven. So make sure this morning that your hope in life after death begins with placing your trust in this 2,000 year old death, that by faith you are united to Jesus and united to his death so that his death is your death, so that you too might be made right with God and have confidence 
that your debt is paid and that your account is full of his righteousness. There's only one solution to the greatest problem facing mankind, and it's not us. There's only one solution, and it starts with making sure you've been united by faith to the death of Christ, embracing the only thing that can get you into heaven. When my family and I got to the ballpark, we linked up with the representative from the team that was there. And, and she said to us, hey, just, just follow me. And as soon as we linked up to her, guess what? Our access to the field was a done deal. As soon as we followed her and, and were connected with her, then, then it was a guarantee that we were going to be on the field. And, and so we went to the elevator with her and she got on the elevator and nobody stopped us because we were following her. And we went down the elevator to the, to the tunnel system and we walked through the tunnels. Nobody stopped us because we were with her. We were following her. And then we walked up the steps and got onto the field and we walked over to the, to the field and nobody stopped us because we were following her. Y'all, if, if you've embraced Christ's death, if his death has become your death, your access to heaven is also a done deal. John 14 tells us he's gone before us to get things ready for us and that he's going to come back for us. And listen, when he comes back for you, no one's going to stop you. You know why? Because you're following Jesus. He's your access. He's got your clearance. And he's the reason why you're going to get to heaven. And this is the rest of Romans 6, 5. It's not just if you've been united to a death like his, but keep going with me in Romans 6, 5. You will certainly be united in a resurrection like his. You will certainly be united in a resurrection like his. Okay, Paul's argument, though, means that we have to know for sure that Jesus is actually what? Risen. Because if he hasn't risen, there's no resurrection for us to be united to. In fact, Paul makes explicitly clear in 1 Corinthians 15 that the Christian faith rises or falls on this doctrine, this teaching, the doctrine of the resurrection. The doctrine of the resurrection is perhaps the greatest and most important doctrine in all of Christianity, more so than the substitutionary atonement of Jesus dying on the cross for your sins. You know why? Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he didn't pay for your sins. And that's Paul's argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, he says this, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. He goes on, he says this, And if Christ has not been raised, then what? Then our, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. He says, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you're still in your sins. What he's saying there is this. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, then he couldn't have died for your sins. And so you're still in your sins. It's the resurrection that is the, the stamp of approval from the Father to the Son saying, payment applied, payment accepted. And so Paul's saying, if Jesus didn't rise, church, we're in trouble. In fact, what he goes on to say is this. He says, then those who have fallen asleep or died, that is, in Christ have, have simply just perished. And he says, and for the rest of us, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Oh, those poor Christians. Don't they understand? They should just go eat, drink, and be merry because there is no eternity. There's no judgment. What are you doing giving up your Sunday mornings to be a church? What are you doing fighting sin? Why not just give in and just enjoy the pleasures of the world? Paul's saying if Christ has not been raised from the dead, we are fools and most to be pitied. let's ask the question, what would keep Christ from raising from the dead? What would keep Christ from rising from the dead is the same thing that would have kept you and I from rising from the dead if we had died on the cross instead. And that's sin. For the wages of sin is death. Here's the thing, y'all. A guilty man can't die for another guilty man. If you've got two people guilty of murder and they're co-defendants in the courtroom, and they're sitting there in the courtroom and the judge has passed one sentence and he's condemned the one, you're guilty, I condemn you to death. The, the, the one that's already condemned, guilty and, and facing death, can't say, oh, judge, I'll take his penalty too. Why don't you just condemn me to his death as well? You understand how that doesn't work, right? 
Because the one that's already been condemned, he has to pay for his sin. He can't pay for the other one's sin. And so a guilty man can't pay for the sins of other guilty people. So if Jesus was guilty for his own sin, then on the cross, he couldn't have paid for anyone else's sins other than his own. And he wouldn't have risen from the dead because the payment wouldn't have been accepted. And so that's the Apostle Paul's argument. He says, we are still in our sins if Christ hasn't raised from the dead. It works something like this. Again, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that means he had his own sin to pay for. Well, if Jesus had his own sin to pay for, he couldn't have paid for ours. And if Jesus couldn't have paid for our sins, then it means we're still in our sins. In other words, church, you're with the wrong person trying to get access to heaven. You can't get there with Jesus if Jesus had sin. You can't get there with Jesus if Jesus never rose from the dead. You're with the wrong person. You're with somebody who has as much clearance as you have. And we've already answered that question. How much clearance do we have? None. None. Thankfully, though, the Bible's clear that Jesus was, in fact, sinless. 2 Corinthians 5.21, we've already referenced this verse. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin. Who, notice that, knew no sin. The sinlessness there of Jesus that Paul is referencing. Or in 1 Peter 2.22, he says, he, speaking of Jesus, committed no sin. Or here in Hebrews chapter 4.15, the, the, the passage talking about how he is a high priest who can sympathize with us. It says, who was tempted as we are yet without sin. Or then there's also Luke 23.47, the centurion at the foot of the cross who speaks better than he knew when he said of Jesus, certainly this man was innocent. I think the centurion at that point is just saying innocent of the charges that put him on the cross. We understand the broader implications here that that Christ was in fact innocent completely. The, the, The Bible bears witness time and time and time again to the sinlessness of Jesus. And yet, church, you know what the greatest evidence and testimony of the sinlessness of Jesus is, yes? It's what we're here this morning to celebrate. It's the empty tomb. It's the fact that Jesus walked out never to walk in again. In fact, this is what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 1 as he's introducing the fact that he was set apart for the service of the gospel. He's unpacking the gospel for us, and he says this in verse 3 and 4. He says, The gospel concerning the Son, Jesus, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and notice this in verse 4 specifically, that he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness. How? How? By the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. The loudest testimony of Jesus' character, deity, identity, and personhood comes when he walks out of the tomb never to enter again. That's the Father saying, payment accepted, payment applied, he's the Son of God. And so that's why it all rises and falls on the resurrection. The resurrection, y'all. That's the access card. When we were in the, the, the stadium, this lady, she had an access card that, that showed everybody that, that she had the, the right to go where she was going. The resurrection of Jesus is his access card wearing around his neck. And as long as with him, you get that access card covering you too. If you've been united with his death, you're going to be united with his resurrection. It's a sure thing. But I want to talk to you in the room. Maybe you're skeptical on all this. There's a, a relatively well-known atheist scholar named Sam Harris out there. And in 2018, Sam Harris was having a conversation with Jordan Peterson. Now, Jordan Peterson is not a believer, but more sympathetic towards Christianity. And they were discussing the resurrection, and Harris asked Peterson, do you really believe in the resurrection? And Peterson said, well, man, that's a hard question to answer. It would take me hours, multiple days to answer that. And, And Harris responded to him and said, well, it wouldn't take me any time at all. I can tell you it's almost certainly not In other words, absolutely not. There's no way Jesus rose from the dead. That's what Harris's position is. Maybe that's your position here this morning. In fact, one of Harris's disciples uh, writes this in response to that particular comment. He says, such a literal, physical resurrection flies in the face of everything we've learned and know about life and death, biology, the ecosystem, nature, etc. Organisms that die don't come back to life. And there seems to be nothing on earth or in heaven that will change the natural order of things or reverse it. He goes on and says, Believing that they do, or at least that Jesus did, creates such a conflict of reason that it shatters all belief in any kind of consistent reality. 
It is things like this that make religion and particularly Christianity in this case look absurd. Maybe that's you this morning. You're sitting there going, yeah. How about another well-known atheist, Richard Dawkins? Richard Dawkins once said this, the virgin birth, the raising of Lazarus, even the Old Testament miracles, and I'm sure he would throw in the, the miracle of the resurrection here as well, are all freely used for religious propaganda, and they are very effective with an audience of unsophisticates and children. Maybe that's your position as well. Yeah, Christianity, the, the, the gospel is a crutch for the unintellectual. Dawkins also said this. He said, presumably what happened to Jesus was what happens to all of us when we die. We decompose. All, or accounts, rather, of Jesus' resurrection and ascension are about as well documented as Jack and the Beanstalk. Another one, a Catholic priest, Joseph, or rather, John P. Meyer. John P. Meyer says this, it's inherently impossible for historians working with empirical evidence within the confines of their discipline ever to make a positive judgment God has directly acted here to accomplish something beyond all human power. And, and so Meyer's saying, stack up all the evidence, it's still impossible to declare that God did this, empirically speaking. One more. Bart Ehrman has a, a disciple named Dr. Marco Marina. And, and Marco Marina writes this, The absence of corroborating evidence, particularly regarding the claim that 500 people witnessed the resurrected Jesus, as mentioned solely in 1 Corinthians 15, further complicates the narrative. It's conceivable that these visions were interpreted and shared among early Christians, contributing to the spread of a new religious movement. So maybe some or all of that appeals to you this morning. You're sitting there thinking to yourself, yeah, that, 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 that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Well, let me address a couple of these for just a moment. On the man commenting about Sam Harris. Listen, when he says there that it flies in the face of everything we've learned and know about life and death, biology, the ecosystem, nature, etc., that organi organisms die and do not come back to life. And there seems to be nothing on earth or in heaven that will change the natural order of these things or reverse it. Listen, when he's saying that this doesn't measure up according to reason, he's right. And, and yet that's what we're talking about here. Y'all, if the resurrection was commonplace, if people were walking out of graves left and right, then how would you choose which one to follow to eternity? The hope of the gospel is that there's only one person that's ever done that. And what we're here to tell you this morning is that God exists, and this is a God thing. One, it's the suspension of natural law. I agree with you. Bodies decay. Go pitch a tent in a cemetery, and you'll never see another person walk out of the grave, never to enter again, at least until Christ comes back. Jesus is the only one that's ever done that, and that's the point of the gospel. That's why we're here saying hope in Jesus. He's the only one that can get you to heaven because he's the only one that's overcome the grave. And so I, I admit it, it, it's true. It's hard to believe. Reason doesn't get us there. But that's the gospel. How about Dr. Dawkins? When Dr. Dawkins goes on and says that the, the, this whole thing about the resurrection and everything else about the Bible is meant for an audience of unsophisticates and children. Again, I'm going to say, you know what, Dr. Dawkins? You're right. What does the Apostle Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1? He says the gospel is foolishness to the world. He says it's, a, it's, it's folly to the, the world and a stumbling block to Jews. And then he tells us who are believers, he says, consider your own calling. Not many of you were wise according to the world's standards. You, you see here, if you're looking for a gospel that is going to appeal to your mind and appeal to the intellect as far as the foundation and the basis for why you should believe, then that's not the gospel of Christianity. Because the gospel of Christianity humbles us. And it brings us to a place where we can't boast in our intellect and in our reason to reach that conclusion. And that's why Jesus said when he did, as he allowed the children to come to him, he said, let the little children come to me. And then he said this, I tell you, agreeing with Dr. Dawkins here, unless you have faith like a child, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. And so Dr. Dawkins, I, I would disagree with your choice of the word propaganda. I think it's truth. But it, it, it does appeal to an audience of unsophisticates and children, and I'm okay with that because the gospel is simple in its core, and the call is to repent and believe in Jesus. 
As far as Dr. Dawkins' comment about lacking as much testimony or, or being about as well documented as Jack and the Beanstalk, on that one I'm going to push back a little bit. Without going into too much detail, there are over 5,000 manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, and that number is growing. That blows Plato and Socrates and Caesar out of the water. And in our schools, when our children sit in schools and they're taught Plato, and they're taught Caesar's Gaelic Wars, and they're taught Socrates' writings, nobody's sitting there saying, well, we can't really trust what he wrote because, you know, manuscript evidence. They're teaching it as this is what he wrote and this is what he meant. The Bible is so much better attested to in manuscript evidence than any of those things. And so what Dr. Dawkins said there is just flat out wrong. It's just flat out wrong. Moving on to Dr. Meyer, though. John Meyer, I don't know if he's a doctor. I'm promoting people on the fly here. <laughs> Maybe he is. We'll give him the benefit of the doubt. Anyways, John Meyer, the, the, the Catholic priest saying it's inherently impossible for historians to make a positive judgment. God has acted here to accomplish something beyond all human power. You know, in a way, I, I even agree with Dr. Meyer here. Because again, faith is not the product of our intellect. Look, evidence can help. Don't get me wrong. Apologetics, helpful. The classical arguments for the existence of God and, and creationism and all those things can be helpful handmaidens to the gospel, but it takes an act of God to save a person. It takes an act of God to give us the faith to believe that Jesus Christ died for, the, for our sins on the cross and rose from the grave three days later. That's a God thing, not a man thing. And so in that sense, I would even agree with Mr. Pastor Reverend Dr. Meyer here. One more, uh, Dr. Marina, I do know he is a doctor, who suggests that this is uh, simply uncorroborated. And, and he points to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, and he, he mentions that Paul says there that he appeared to, to 500 people, and he says solely in 1 Corinthians 15, as though there, there's no other place that, that, that that's mentioned. But I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul actually says there in, in 1 Corinthians 15, because I think it's worth note, and it's, it's conveniently left out by this gentleman here. Uh, the Apostle Paul says here that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. This is verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 15. And that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. And then Paul says this, most of whom are still alive. Why would Paul say that? Paul's saying, go, go ask them. Paul's not hiding this. Paul's not saying, uh, but don't worry about that. Don't worry about who they are. He says, most of them are still alive. You want to go find out? Go find out. In fact, Paul goes on to say, and it appeared to me. And so to suggest that there's not enough corroborating evidence, I'm, I'm going to take an issue with Dr. Marina in that regard because that's just simply not the case. In fact, if you, we look even to just the internal evidence and some of the external evidence of what happened after the, the cross and the resurrection, think about the transformed lives of the disciples. Where was Peter when Jesus was being tried and crucified? What was Peter doing? He was denying him three times to a slave girl. And then he was hiding while Jesus was suffering. Where's Peter in the book of Acts? Peter's standing up boldly preaching faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, looking at the Jews that he ran from earlier, saying, this Jesus you crucified, according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Peter's being beaten and arrested for his faith. Peter will eventually, according to, hum to, to church tradition, be crucified upside down for his testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. What changed in Peter other than the fact that he actually truly did encounter the resurrected Jesus Christ? Or think about beyond just that, there's also the fact that, that this minor thing happened. No one has ever produced the body of Jesus in the early days, the, the, the church, during its growth, if the opponents, and there were plenty of opponents to the church early on, if they wanted to silence the Christians, go to the tomb and produce the body. And the argument, well, the disciples stole the body. So many of them died for their testimony that Jesus rose from the dead, that they, they would have had to all have been just simply insane people to be willing to die knowing that they had stolen the body and moved it somewhere else. No one produced the body. Back in 2008, James Cameron did this whole, doc yeah, the Titanic guy. By the way, the ship sinks, and there was room for both of them on the, on the, the door. <laughs> Anyways, James Cameron released a documentary 
about this ossuary, this bone box that had been found way back, I believe back in the 70s or 80s, but it came to light again in 2007. And on the bone box, it read Jesus, son of Joseph. And so everybody was all up in arms. We found the bones of Jesus. Here's the body of Jesus. There's some problems with this though. Uh, Number one, that bone box was located in the surrounding area of, uh, of Jerusalem. And they believe that it was a family tomb. They're calling this the family tomb of Jesus. Well, the family tombs were, were built and, and placed where the family uh, resided. And, and where was Jesus' family from? Jesus of Nazareth. Guess where Nazareth is? Not anywhere near Jerusalem. It's way up north. Okay, so that, that doesn't hold. The second thing that doesn't hold is, is the, the, the elaborate and ornate uh, supplies of these, these, these boxes, the way that they were designed, everything else. Jesus' dad being a carpenter, his family would have never been able to afford a tomb like that or ossuaries like that. And then you add to that, on top of that, these names that they found on the, the box, Joseph, uh, Jesus, Mary, uh, th- these were such common names that it would be like finding a tomb today with the name John and Steve and, uh, I don't know, another common name, but just think of another common name off the top of your head and, and being like, well, it must be this John and James and Steve. James, I just threw out another one there. I don't know where that came from. It doesn't hold up, y'all. So have they found the body of Jesus? No, they haven't found the body of Jesus. And then the third and final act, uh, piece of corroborating evidence that I want you to consider this morning is the just rapid explosion of the church. The church grew so fast on the heels of the resurrection. Thousands of people being saved. And the only explicable answer is that Jesus actually rose from the dead. That Jesus actually rose from the dead. Uh, Josephus was a Jewish historian, certainly not a friend of the church necessarily, in writing in AD 93, okay, AD 93, Josephus writes this, when Pilate, because of an accusation made by leading men among us, condemned him to the cross, he's talking about Jesus, he's referenced Jesus just prior to this, those who had loved him previously did not cease to do so, for they reported that he appears to them alive, and up until this very day, the tribe of Christians named after him has not died out. That's AD 93. Here you have a source outside the Bible talking about how the Christians were thriving based on a profession and a belief that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. This and other things has led J.C. Ryle to say this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is one of the best attested facts on record. There were so many witnesses to behold it that if we do in the least de- that we, if we do in the least degree receive the credibility of men's testimonies, we cannot and we dare not doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. And to that I say, Amen. In fact, the Apostle Paul was confident as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse twenty, he says, "But in fact, in fact, Christ has." raised from the dead, been raised from the dead. And then he says this, the the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The the first fruits, this harkens back to an Old Testament offering. And the first fruits were a pledge of what would follow. And it was given to God first. And then it was, in in a sense, a guarantee of of everything that would follow behind it. And so Jesus, y'all, is our first fruits of the resurrection. He went first, we will follow. Essentially, this is just another way of the Apostle Paul saying in Romans 6, 5, if you've been united with him in a death like his, you will also be certainly, certainly united with him in a resurrection like his. Church, Jesus has risen. And if you've been united with his death, that means you will too. You will rise to, this is the foundation of our hope in life after death. Only Jesus Christ. No one else can get you to heaven. Only Jesus Christ. And so it starts with being sure that his death is your death. And then finally this morning, be sure his life is your life. Be sure his life, this resurrection life, is your life. Jesus says in John chapter 12, verse 24, truly, truly, and he's speaking of himself here, by the way, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus is speaking of himself here, his death that would bear much fruit, that fruit of redeemed souls of you and me. If you have been united with his death, you will certainly be united with his resurrection. You may not know, he pitches, by the way, for the world champion at Texas Rangers. Never going to get tired of that. This guy, was his name is Brett Martin. 
Maybe you know him if, if you have followed the Rangers for very long. Maybe you don't. Here's what's unique about Brett Martin. Guess what Brett, Brett Martin got yesterday from the Rangers with the rest of the team? He got a World Series ring. I don't have one. I wish I did. I don't have one. Anybody in, into giving a pastor a gift, a World Series ring? I mean, I wouldn't turn it down. You know, so Brett Martin, he, he got a World Series ring. Okay, he was on the team. Okay, here's what makes Brett Martin unique. Brett Martin missed the entire season last season with a shoulder injury. Brett Martin never took the mound a single inning or a single pitch for all of 2023 for the world champion Texas Rangers. He didn't pitch in the playoffs. He didn't pitch in the regular season. He didn't contribute, but he got the ring. Why did he get the ring? Because he was with the right people. Because the victory of the team became his victory. Y'all, for us as Christians, Christ's victory over death becomes our victory over death. We don't throw a pitch. We don't die on the cross. We don't pay for our sins. He did. And then his victory becomes our victory. And so his resurrection, his life becomes our life. But what is that resurrection like? What are we talking about? Why should we desire that? Why should we want that? Just a few concluding thoughts here. Number one, I want you to note that this resurrection is yet future, okay? We're not talking about right now. So the message of Christianity is not come to Jesus and your life's gonna be hunky-dory from this time forward. You probably haven't heard that phrase in a long time, huh? That your life is gonna be fine, that you're not gonna suffer, that you're not gonna have any pain or that you're, you're not gonna die. In fact, the fact that we're talking about a resurrection implies that we will eventually die here why this is important is that future resurrection means that this suffering and this life that you're living right now and the pain and the sorrow that you feel right now, it's not the end. It's not the final word. That there's a future and you will rise just like Jesus rose. So it's yet future. The second thing I want you to notice is though it's yet future, the resurrection does have a bearing on your life today. There's an already not yet component of it. The Apostle Paul talks about this as he continues on in Romans chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. He says, For the death he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That's a present tense, church, that today you consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Why is that good news for you? Well, it's good news for you because of this. If you have a sin that besets you, if you have a sin that's plagued you, in Christ, you can have freedom from that sin today. In Christ, the power of sin dies at the cross so that you now have the ability to be set free from that sin. And so his resurrection has a bearing on your future, but also on your present. But the final thing I want you to think about with the resurrection is that it's forever. That's forever. It's forever. And we read this in Romans 6 verse 9. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. And his resurrection is going to be our resurrection. A resurrection like his. Meaning one day we're going to walk out of the grave too. Never to enter again. Think about the other resurrections in the Bible. Lazarus. Guess what happened to Lazarus? Yeah, he died again. How about the, the widow's son that Jesus raised? Guess what happened to the widow's son? He, he died again. Or, or that strange phenomenon when, when the curtain tore in two, all the people walked out of the grave when, when Jesus died. Guess what happened to them? Well, eventually they were put back in those graves because they all died again. Jesus' resurrection wasn't just a resuscitation. He beat death forever for himself and for all who would be united to his death so that we would be united to his resurrection. That's why the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that there is a day coming, church, when we will be able to say, death, where's your victory? Death, where is your sting? Right now, death, when you lose a loved one, it feels pretty defeating. When you lose somebody that you care about, it hurts. But there's a day coming, y'all, when we're going to be with Jesus and death is going to be in the rearview mirror and we're going to be able to taunt the great enemy and say, where's your victory? Where's your sting? It's not here because we're with the one that beat you. And his victory is our victory. And so let me ask you this morning, church, is his life your life? Are you with the right person to get you to heaven? If that answer is anyone other than Jesus, the answer is you're not with the right person. You need to be united to Jesus. And if you're saying, how do I do that this morning? It looks like this. It looks like, number one, understanding and recognizing that, again, the greatest problem facing mankind is your problem too, and that problem is sin. That that's a universal problem. 
and recognizing that number two, that that sin means that you are facing a wages, that you are facing a penalty, and that penalty is the full wrath of God. And that wrath of God is against you and it's against your sin and there's nothing you can do about that. Which means, third thing you need to understand and recognize this morning is that there's only two options then. The first is an eternity in hell suffering under the judgment of God for your sin. The second is you put your trust in Jesus that he took your place in his death on the cross becomes your death on the cross. And all that wrath of God against you is now satisfied because it was poured out on Jesus. And then as we've been talking about this morning, you recognize and understand that Jesus rose from the dead never to enter again. So you will one day as well. So if that's you this morning, if you haven't made that decision this morning, can I ask you to do this this morning? Repent from your sin. Repent means to turn away from it, to be done with it. It's the military term to do an about face. Do an about face from your sin, for living for yourself, for trusting in yourself, and put your trust in Jesus. Trust in his death, that he's paid your debt, and that there's not a single ounce of God's wrath left for you. Trust that he gave you, or will give you, if you put your trust in him, his full righteousness, which gives you full access and clearance to God into heaven. And then finally, trust this morning, what we're celebrating today, that he is risen. He is risen indeed. And if you do that this morning, you can walk out knowing for sure that you have everything that you need to get into heaven because you have the resurrected Jesus. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. On the way out this morning, two things. Number one, we have some cinnamon rolls for you, which are Amazing. I got to try some last week, so please enjoy those. But then the second thing is this. We have a a little plant back there. We don't have enough for everybody to take one, but if you can grab one per family, that would be super helpful. Um, On that plate is our verse, or on that plant is our verse for today. Romans 6, 5. If you've been united with him in a death like his, you will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We chose a succulent because those are super hard to kill. No, but we want you to take that with you and put it someplace that you're going to see it on a regular basis because that's a, that plant is a reminder of what we talked about this morning. Life from death. That seed dies, the life emerges. That's our hope. The tomb was empty. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise God for that reality. Will you stand with me as I pray and then we'll be dismissed.